Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and the Patreons over on Patreon voted for Pennsylvania to be covered in the next Statehood video. If you'd like to participate and choose the next topic for future videos, please join the Patreon page for as little as $1 and cast your ballot. When the Constitutional Convention that met in Philadelphia ended, most delegates were positive that the New England states would easily ratify the new constitution. However, some northeastern states were questionable, like New York and in particular, Pennsylvania. Despite the Constitutional Convention taking place in their state, many of the western delegates did not care for the powerful federal government proposed in the new constitution. Pennsylvania's Federalists fought from the start to suppress any opposition to the constitution. First, they neglected distributing copies of the Constitution to the western part of the state, hoping that if they could not read the Constitution, they could not form arguments against it. They also restricted the printing of materials that outlined the pros and cons of the Constitution, even going so far as to stop publishing arguments for the Constitution because, in their minds, if someone needed to argue for the Constitution, there must be an argument against it. The convention met from November 21st, to December 15, 1787 in Philadelphia, but we know very little about the opposition to the Constitution because newspapers were pressured to not print the debates, and if they did, only print the ones in favor of the Constitution. Alexander J. Dallas, the Jamaican-born editor of the Pennsylvania Herald, began printing the full convention in his newspaper, but because of the length of the speeches, he had to stretch it out over multiple issues. By the time the convention ended, he had only published part of the convention's debates. Around a hundred Federalists threatened to cancel their subscription to the Herald if any more debates were printed, and then Dallas was fired. The convention got off on a rocky start. November 20th, the day they were supposed to start, saw very few delegates present because many were running late. Only 38 of the 69 were present. By November 21st, 60 of the delegates were present, and they began the convention in the Pennsylvania State House now known as Independence Hall. Dr. Benjamin Rush suggested that they open with a prayer, but that immediately led to opposition, men stating that because of the religious diversity of the state, that someone would be offended. Plus, they stated that none of their other state legislative sessions or other conventions opened with a prayer and that this one should be no different. Rush suggested that that was the reason that the state was so divided, but the opposition to the prayer declared that statement full of superstition. During the opening days, James Wilson, the only member of the Constitutional Convention to be present at Pennsylvania's Ratification Convention, gave an admittedly long speech declaring the uniqueness of the American experiment and promoting the importance of the Constitution to the solidarity of the nation. He also felt it his duty as a delegate to the Constitutional Convention to explain the reasoning for many of the parts of the Constitution. John Smiley, a delegate from the West, got up next and knowing that the Federalists outnumbered his group two to one, simply advocated for a debate, not a general vote. He stated that the convention to construct the document took four months. Could not the document withstand a few days of debate? The delegates wanted to work through the Constitution in order, but got stuck over the first three words, we the people. The Anti-Federalists asserted that that statement appeared to undercut the sovereignty of the individual states. This debate lasted some time and both sides agreed to move on because the debate seemed as though it would never end. As with the other ratifying conventions in the states, the Anti-Federalists wanted a Bill of Rights. They were not content with the wording of the Constitution that it would guarantee certain rights to individuals in the country. The Federalists argued that unless the government was given the express power to do something, it could not go beyond those bounds. But the Anti-Federalists believed that the government would interfere with those rights if they were not outlined in a Bill of Rights. Next, they discussed the idea of sovereignty of the states. Anti-Federalists thought that a central government would eventually do away with state power. James Wilson stood up for the Constitution. He stated that sovereignty did not reside in any set of government institutions, but in the people, and the people would only give the government enough power necessary for the public welfare. To back up their point that the federal government would dismantle the state governments, or at the very least, their sovereignty, they brought up the power to tax, arguing that they could not have two sovereign entities with the power to tax. James Wilson spoke from the Federalist perspective and questioned why there couldn't be, and saw no reason why two sovereign entities 
could not have the power to tax, it was completely possible. In general, the Anti-Federalists attacked the importation of slaves to be extended for 20 years. The Federalists, although not wholly in favor of the slave trade, explained that they needed that provision in the Constitution in order for the Deep South states to ratify the Constitution. Another discussion in the convention involved the country of Sweden. When an anti-federalist balked at the Constitution not guaranteeing a trial by a jury in civil cases like they did for criminal cases, they stated that when Sweden abandoned jury trials, the common people lost their freedom and a tyrannical aristocracy took over. The federalists objected that that was even historically accurate and demanded to know their source. Thomas McKean, a Pennsylvania Chief Justice, insisted that trial by jury never existed anywhere but in England and governments modeled on that of England. The Anti-Federalist agreed to give his source, but all agreed that would take too much time. When they reconvened on December 10th, the Anti-Federalist showed his source of the claim about Sweden, and it had come from William Blackstone's authoritative commentaries on the laws of England, which Blackstone attributed the invention of trial by jury to a king of Sweden and Denmark. Blackstone also recalled that with the disuse of trial by jury, an aristocracy had risen up and took control of the government, leaving the common people to languish under oppression. James Wilson, the Federalist who would address the source, and the Anti-Federalist who brought it up, quoted Sir John Maynard by saying, Young man, I have forgotten more law than ever you learned. Then he broke out into a speech that lasted both the morning and evening session of that day. He would say in that speech that the Constitution is not a compact between states, but an ordinance, an establishment of the people, and that although the Constitution was not perfect, it was greatly superior to the Articles of Confederation. As the convention continued, two obstacles emerged. One was the fact that barely a sixth of the voting population voted to elect convention delegates. Anti-Federalists viewed ratifying the Constitution as wrong because not even half of the people voted for delegates to the convention to ratify it. Federalists insisted that people didn't vote because they knew the Constitution would be passed so they didn't feel they needed to vote. The second obstacle was a discussion of a Bill of Rights. The Anti-Federalists insisted on a few amendments to be recommended for ratification along with the Constitution. One was a trial by jury for reasons mentioned earlier. Another was the right to bear arms for the defense of oneself, their state, or the United States and for the purpose of killing game. They included that no law could disarm the people except for crimes committed or real danger of public injury from individuals. They wanted a small, nearly non-existent standing army because standing armies were seen as the biggest threat to freedom. Among the changes to the Constitution, Anti-Federalists wanted the House of Representatives to be larger and be elected every year to reduce their power. Despite the Anti-Federalist remarks and arguments, the Federalists held a majority and they called for a vote. On December 12th, less than a week after Delaware's vote made that state the first to approve, and after a rather extensive discussion, the convention voted to ratify the Constitution 46 to 23. The Anti-Federalists made a final effort to introduce amendments before the vote, but the Federalists were firmly in control. <laughs>